All right, let's pray. Father, as we begin this morning, we ask your blessings upon this day, especially with all the things happening. Please be with us, be among us, and guide us so that we understand everything that you desire for us, who we truly are, and what you desire for us to be. Bless our study of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Josh, come here for a second. Um, so we, we're going to kind of recap verse 10 a little bit. Let me get this to you now so we don't worry about it. All right, that way you've got it. All right. Good job on emptying the trash, by the way. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> there is none righteous, not even one. Paul is in this whole area of, of dialoguing about almost using almost a, a logical argument, which makes sense since he's writing to the to to Rome to the Romans who were, who were very highly educated and and Greek thought had taken over the world the idea of logic and reason, so he's using logical arguments, uh, you know, through this section of Romans, I, you know, so that they kind of track with him and understand what he's saying to them about the truth of God. So he said, "There's none that are righteous." There's not a single righteous person in the world. Now, uh, Jesus, we talked about that last week, I think a little bit. Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. You know, and Jesus is in that discussion when they when the people call him, you know, good teacher. He, he's being, using a re, kind of reverse psychology. You say there's, you know, there's no one good but God, but you're calling me good. So who does that say that I am? If I'm good and there's no one good but God, who am I then? Obviously, I'm God. It was one of those ways where he was declaring that he was God. So he's using a, a, a reason and logic in a sense to reveal the truth to them, making them think. So the passage is, You shall be holy, for I am holy, for all sin shall show the glory of God. Who can make clean out of the unclean? No one. What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? All these passages talk about the sinfulness of humanity. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Other translations in Jeremiah there will say desperately wicked. Okay? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. Uh, notice he's kind of following the Ten Commandments there. Loosely. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil. Thoughts, evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries. Uh, Jesus said to them, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. There's that passage. Okay? Uh, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All these passages are reiterating the fact that we don't have a chance. On our own, we're sinful human beings. So there's nothing that we can do for ourselves. We did cover this last week. What about infants and small children? Aren't they holy until they actually do something wrong? And we talked a little bit about the, 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 the understanding or the, the belief of, one, of uh, age of accountability. Remember, that is a, a purely American thing. You understand that? All the churches that had their origin in Europe, Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, Episcopal, Anglican, Lutheran, Orthodox, all the historic churches, the older churches, understand infant baptism and original sin, and that every human being is sinful and needs the grace of God, and therefore God has given us baptism as an avenue through which he creates faith in the heart, which is not, a, it's not about reason and logic, not about our understanding, but about faith in the heart. It's a spirit thing. America, the churches that started here, Baptist, Church of Christ, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Barn Church, whatever, you pick one. All have this idea that you're born innocent and sinless. And when you grow up enough that you understand right and wrong, you reach an age of accountability where you then have to make a decision on your own. And you have to choose Jesus. But all these passages we're talking about say it's, we're sinful. It's impossible for us to go to God. That's why it's about grace. God comes to us. And it's not an age thing. It's a spirit thing. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit communicating with our spirit. So I don't, you know, I usually tell people, you know, not pick anybody, say in the Church of Christ or Baptist Church, a kid gets up at 11 or 12 years old in the service when the preacher gives an altar call and he walks the aisle, probably because dad's saying it's time for you to go. That's what he's been taught to do. 
He's been taught to express his faith this way. Nobody ever got up to walk the aisle thinking, I hate God, I don't want to be a Christian. They walk the aisle because they already love God. They're just taught to express it in a backwards way. It's not that God didn't work. It's not that God doesn't work there. It's just they don't understand how the correct expression of it. We don't deny their faith. We just deny their practice, that they wait for baptism till later. Because they also make baptism an outward show of an inward reality. It's me showing the world what I believe. Okay, understand, God never gives us anything to do that doesn't have a purpose. God never does anything just for show. When, he, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, it's not just for show. There's something significant going on here. When he tells us where to baptize, it's not just for show. There's something significant, and it's always God doing something. Because grace is always directional. It's always God to us. We respond to grace. It's not about what we do. It's about what God is doing in us. So, uh, the Lord smelled the, smooth, the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. What's God saying? All of them are sinful. From youth, all of them are sinful. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. When a child is born in this world, is he of the flesh or of the spirit? Flesh. Well, the flesh. When the spirit of God comes, a rebirth of the spirit happens. Uh, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We're not talking about a six-month-old child having done something wrong. We're talking about the corruption of human nature. That's why children die. If they were holy, if they were perfect, there'd be no sickness and disease in children until they reached an age of accountability because disease, sickness, and death follow sinfulness. Okay? So the, the fact that a child will die is evidence that a child is not holy. And anyone who's not holy is not acceptable to God. Okay? Okay? Uh, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as a rest. Our very nature is corrupted. That's why we talked about last week. You don't have to teach a child to be bad, you teach him to be good. Being bad comes naturally. Our sinful nature demands and desires what it wants. That's why a child throws a fit when it doesn't get its way, because our flesh wants what it wants and it wants it now. Okay? So God is a gracious God who says, I'm going to provide a means of salvation for everyone. And that's where, you know, having gone to a church of Christ college, we have this argument a lot. Uh, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, re repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for you and your children, and this for as many as the Lord our God's so-called. So they say, Peter's preaching to the crowds in Acts chapter 2. They're all adults. Well, one, you can't say they're all adults. There's thousands of people gathered there. He doesn't limit the age of baptism. And the word used in, the second, in Acts 2.38 you know, is, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter attaches forgiveness of sins and the coming of the Spirit together in baptism. Then the next verse, verse 39, the gift is for you and your children and for all and for all. They say, well, that's your children when you get when they get old enough. That's not what it says. And the Greek is very specific. There are, there are uh, brephos, children, little infants. Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them. There's a word for infants. There's a word for older children in the Greek. And then there's technon, which is children of all ages. And that's what Peter uses. This is for you and your children of all ages and all whom the Lord our God will call. He's not putting an age restriction on children getting baptized. Okay? And, and that's where you have to just study it out and understand what he's talking about. New verse. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Left on his own, sinful man does what? creates a God in his own image. There is, there is the truth that uh, inside every human spirit and heart, we use heart as a slang, you know, shorthand term, inside every human heart, there's a hole. There's an emptiness. 
there is this innate knowledge. There's something more than me. And I need to connect with that. So what does man do? He creates a god, but the only thing he can go by is himself. So all the Greek and Roman gods, Zeus and Aphrodite and Mars and you know Athena and you know all these different gods, are nothing but personified human beings. They have all the weaknesses and all the failings of human beings, but they're you know superpowered. Okay, and so they uh, they do all the sinful things. Zeus has many lovers and many children. Okay? Always having affairs. Right? Um, that's how you get the demigods. And so when, when man created a god, it was just like him, just mightier than him. So that he could justify himself. If I do these things, that's what the gods do. So I must be okay. Every system of religion that man has ever developed puts, puts shows a God that is not perfect and holy, and we only have a certain standard we have to meet to be acceptable. Okay? And if I can meet that standard, I have relative assurance of eternal life. God comes along and says, I'm holy, be like me, or go to hell. And we look, hey, I can't do it. It's impossible. I'm lost. God says, okay, I'll love you anyway, and I'll save you. It's purely, totally by grace. We can't do it ourselves, so he does it for us. Um, so, in his heart, sinful man thinks he is God. He even refuses to acknowledge and seek the true God. It's not that God didn't reveal himself in the world. Sinful man said, no, I don't want it. Uh, the word there, there's no one who understands. To understand the sense of perceive or comprehend, there's no one who does that. That's the Greek word up there, sun, uh, sunion. Uh, there's no one who has that desire to truly comprehend and understand God. Even as Christians, we fall short of that. Because we take the, the shorthand version of our Christian faith that we've heard and been taught, and we don't go any deeper. We don't desire to plumb the depths of, of, what, of who God is and what he's like. I mean, how many of you grew up with the idea that God the Father's in charge He's the dictator. He tells the Son and the Spirit what they'll do. Yeah. And, and they, you know, he's the, the white-bearded man who, it's his way or the highway, ready to shoot proverbial lightning bolts at you if you mess up. Is that, that the image that so many people have of God? And you won't find that image in the Bible. God is the, the yearning, waiting father, yearning for his children to come home. He's the old man running down the road. He's the shepherd searching for his lost sheep, the woman searching for the lost coin. His heart is compassionate and loving, and he's seeking. And the Trinity is not ruled by authority and power. It's ruled by love. God the Father loves the Son and wants to give him all glory. God the Son loves the Father and wants to do for the Father what will bring joy to his grieving heart because he's lost his children. And the Spirit loves the Father and the Son and, and is ready and willing to do everything to accomplish for the Father and the Son what they desire. Jesus died for the sins of the world. What is the Spirit doing? To accomplish in us, bringing us to Jesus as our Savior. So that everything Jesus did can be ours. Because that's what Jesus, why would Jesus die for us if he didn't want us? And then once, we, once he has us, he gives us to the Father. Everything is, is about love. My favorite is, why would he die for me if he doesn't know me? He knows you. Even before you were here. And that's where you go to the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, about the second or third verse in the end, where Solomon has talked about old age and what it means to grow old. He, uses, uh, he talks an allegory. You know, snow caps the mountains. You're feeble on your feet. He uses all these images of, of growing old. The eyes can, are no longer shining, you know, no longer bright. And you know, you're getting blind, you're getting feeble, you're getting old, and when you die, your body returns to the dust from which it came, and the, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. What's he saying? That the moment Bobby was conceived, the moment sperm hit egg, God created a spirit. Why? Because he wants to know 
He wants a relationship with the body in there. And he cre relates to us. You know, he created us as spirit beings as well as flesh. So when you die, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. And, and we will stand before God at, and he will judge. And one of the nice things about the book of Romans is because it's a very legal approach. It's like a courtroom. Here's the evidence. But because of Jesus, God declares a verdict, not guilty. We know the verdict in advance because God's already told us what his verdict is. We have faith in Christ. He declares us not guilty. The unbeliever stands before God when he dies and he says, sorry, guilty, no faith. No one ever went to hell because they're sinful. Went to hell because they have no faith. Having been rejected because of no faith, then you suffer for sin. Faith is either admittance to heaven or denial of heaven. All right? Uh, it is impossible with the unbelieving mind to understand God. What does the unbeliever think about God? Distant, unloving, vengeful, wrathful, angry. That's what the unbeliever thinks of God. And they blame God. If God was really a loving God, he wouldn't let this happen. If God was really a loving God, he'd give me what I wanted. And so they put their perceptions of what they think God ought to be, which are man's idea, on God. It's impossible for the unbelieving mind to comprehend God. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. It's not that God didn't reveal himself in the world. Look at creation. Creation testifies to an order. Look at the cosmos, the, the mathematical precision of the planets and everything else. It didn't happen by accident. But because sinful man doesn't want to accept the reality of God, what does he do? He says, evolution. Yeah. And the theory of evolution is a lie. Because you have to, scientific, of course, who knows about science today? Nobody follows science today. That's obvious after COVID. But, but you've, got, you've got science, my idea. I have a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I have to prove it for it to move from hypothesis to theory. And it has to be proven over and over again, like it's consistently always the same, for it to move from theory to fact. Okay? My hypothesis is two plus two is four. I add two and two together and I get four. That's my, that's my theory, I've demonstrated it. But now I do it over and over and over again, and two plus two is always four, that becomes a fact. Try it with any bit of science. They cannot prove the first step of evolution factually at all, ever. So it is still in the hypothesis stage. It's an idea we've got. They've never moved to theory and certainly never moved to fact because they've never been able to demonstrate one bit of evolution. There's no half monkey, half human. Did all of a sudden they just stop? There's no half bird, half dog or whatever you want to pick. There's nothing in the process of evolution. It didn't just get someplace and stop if, if, if evolution is correct. It's ongoing all the time. That's the whole premise. It never, you know, and it wouldn't be uh, humans evolved this far and now they're done and something else will evolve. No, we're all evolving if evolution is correct. But there's nothing. So there's no fact to move it from, no evidence to move from hypothesis to theory or theory to fact. Yeah. And yet it's taught as truth. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. They refuse to accept God because if God is real, I'm accountable. So they have no God. You know, I saw this thing where it says that science is a thing of evidence. You need to see it. And that one, and he's a PH doctor, he said, however, if God were to show himself, everything that we study, everything that we know in science, regardless of how many certificates you have on your wall, will be thrown in the trash if he showed up. That's just it. He did show up. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Jesus I, showed up. Yeah, no, he did. <laughs> but they don't accept that. Yeah, that they won't exactly, exactly. They won't accept that. So even though they knew God, they did not honor him or give him thanks, but became futile in their speculations and, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Another passage that emphasizes the same thing. 
All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There, there is not even one. So, Psalm, so Paul's quoting Psalm 14. What is the meaning? All humanity is worthless, being of no value, and sinful, deserving wrath. That's reality. How does that make you feel? It, ma it makes me feel bad yeah. for my fellow oh. brothers who don't believe, but it makes me feel good that I do believe. Well, but, you know, all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. All humanity is in the same boat. We are worthless. There is no value in this earth. Okay? The only value you can get is the $28 worth of minerals in your body if they were to boil you down. That's about it. Okay? But watch. Watch. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. They would have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Paul Solomon talking about that. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, what's Jeremiah doing figure two? They, you know, I'm the source of living water. Maybe you kind of an idea where Jesus got that idea when he's teaching it. And what you do can't even hold water. <laughs> you make your false gods. Okay. The cisterns, those are like bases. Well, a cistern is a thing that catches water. Okay. Uh, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. That place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. For all of, of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All of us like a leaf wither. And our injustices, and I'm sorry, our iniquities like the wind take us away. Now there's several things in that passage out of Isaiah that you don't normally catch. I don't want to gross anybody out. Jackie's probably heard this before. Filthy garment and a leaf. Where do you get the image of a leaf? Is that is he referencing to a period? Well, the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Fig leaves aren't going to cover. Mm -hmm. Filthy garment. This garment stained. All one is unclean. Uh, the reference is to a used minstrel rag. Yeah. That's, that's that right. is despicable to look upon and you're left in your nakedness like Adam and Eve in the garden nothing to cover you okay God looks at us in the con in this condition and chooses to love us in Christ you know what's Paul saying you don't deserve it there's nothing in you to warrant it it's purely grace God's undeserved unmerited love and favor God chooses to love you when you're unlovable. God chooses to love you when you hate him. That's the wonder of agape love. Remember, there are four kinds of love in the Greek literature. Three are in the Bible, one is not. Storge is the love that is not listed in the Bible. It's in Greek literature. It's identified as the instinctive love an animal has for its young, where they will nurse and protect and defend them, but they someday kick them out of the den. Okay? Then there's eros, from, which is in the Bible, where you get the word erotic. It's a sensual love, passionate love. That's a real love that is perver easily perverted because of sin. Eros is, needs to be wholesome and healthy in marriage, but it's perverted in the porn industry. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, philos is true love between people. Philadelphia gets its name there. The city of brotherly love. Adelphos is brother. Philos is love. I love my brothers. I love my sisters. I will die for you because I love you. But the Jobo down the street, I don't know him. Let him die. I'm not going to anything for him. You love those who love you. You hate those who hate you. That's Philos. Agape is the kind of love that has its origin in God's heart, which you cannot have apart from experiencing it. 
And that's the love that God has. He says, I will love you if you love me. I will love you if you hate me. I will die for you because you are mine. I will die for you even if you despise me because I love you. It's a love that chooses to love even when the one who is being loved is unworthy. That's the kind of love that God has for us. That's this love who chooses to love us even though we are useless, worthless because of sin. He loves us and wants to transform us into something of great value. Think about it. They mine a rock out of the ground. That rock is a rock. But when they refine it, it becomes gold. Take all the impurities away and make something of value out of it. Something with a diamond or whatever. It's just a rock until the master puts his hand on it and creates something wondrous out of it. The only, that illustration falls, falls short because there's something of value in that to begin with, but you, you don't see it until the master works it. Yeah. God takes us who are worthless and of value and creates in us something of worth and value in his eyes through faith. Yeah. So. I did a, a, a short sermon for Kermit on the, on the, that philosophy we were just talking about, the sculpture. And how God sees us as a, a moldy clay and he starts chipping away all the bad until he reveals who you are and that's a true Christian. Mm -hmm. And the story of the sculptor, I picked that up from the story of the sculptor. Mm -hmm. He sees a block of stone, there's nothing there. Yeah, he starts But, but when he puts his hand to it, a masterpiece emerges. That's true, us. even though you, uh, you've been a pastor most of your adult life, have you ever felt unworthy? Yes. Remember? <laughs> Until I finally came to understand um, and it took me being honest. I thought for the first almost 20 years I served as a pastor that I wanted you to go to heaven. I knew God loved you and wanted you, but I was going to hell because I wasn't worthy. You know, because everything that happened in my past, I and the scars that are there, I felt like God really wouldn't want me, but I know God's good. I know God loves and he wants everybody. I'm the one person that's too damaged. He really doesn't want me, but I'm going to make sure that you know that God wants you. Yeah. And work hard at that. And then when I die, I'll go to hell. I was okay with that. Frightening how you can be deceived. Yeah, because I was reading on that sermon paper you gave me where Billy Graham stated that he always felt unworthy to preach a sermon. Mm -hmm. So... All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Who's the him? Jesus. Jesus. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Who's that? God. Well, Jesus. Jesus. The shepherd and guardian, the one who guards your soul. Okay? Protects you. Who, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. To purify, no longer worthless, no longer of no value, like purifying a rock and turning it into, some, into gold. You know, all the impurities are taken away and you have something that's pure. Again, he's talking about the unbelievers. Man without knowledge of God. Their throat is an open grave their tongues, with their tongues that keep deceiving, the poison of asps is under their lips. Pretty strong statement. Paul is, is <laughs> blasting them. You know, he's, walking, he's going into a city that is the capital of the empire where every belief system in the world at that point is present. You can go believe in incarnation, you can go believe in Zeus, you can go believe in... You know, whatever you want. All, all religions are equal. Okay? And they all accept each other. Christianity comes in and says, all you are false. And they say, we hate you. <laughs> because Christianity comes in and says, we have the one true religion. Okay? So, Paul is again quoting scripture to declare the truth. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Well, he's quoting. They sharpen their tongues as a serpent, poison 
of a viper is under their lips. And it's so easy for us to look at those verses and say, that's them over there. Mm -hmm. You know, I was never that bad or, you know, something or other. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say, but we have a tendency to not accept who we were or who we could be without Christ. How bad we were. Right. And because we want to look at the horrible serial killer or the child molester or the drug dealer and say, those are horrible people. Mm -hmm. But we forget that we ourselves, apart from Christ, were horrible people. You know, it only takes one sin to make you filthy and unclean. Okay? We are, you know, the idea of a sinful human being, no faith, is equivalent to going out here and by the dumpster somebody threw out a dog 10 days ago. It's dead. And it's swollen, bloated, burst, maggots are all over it. You can smell it at the front doors of the church, even though it's at the dumpster. And you walk over there, and the closer you get, the more repugnant it gets. And if you, if you get a glimpse of it, you turn away because it's so sickening. That's us before God without Christ. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what sin is to God. That's how despicable, which you understand that, counter that with how much he loves us, that he chooses to love us, even, that's our, even though that's our condition. And he chooses to save us. You, then you start understanding the magnitude of what a godly love is. I will die for you even though you're unworthy, even though you hate me. That's, uh, I've, never, I've never thought of it that way. Once again, Pastor Russ, touche. <laughs> Why say poison? What they say is poison to those around them, okay? Let's uh, pick Hollywood. Let's pick on Hollywood for a minute. What's one of the most popular religions in Hollywood? Scientology. Scientology. Okay. You know what they believe? Um, I've heard certain things. Aliens from other planets brought us here oh, and, yeah. and, and planted us kind of like seeds and have overseen us and they believe in UFOs and other planets and when you die you get to go be with other, you know, one of these God creatures from other planets and stuff. You know, doesn't it sound wonderful? You know, that we're going to, when we die, we're going to go, you know, out there in outer space and we're going to be, you know, with all these, you know, whatevers and, you know, or our, our, Reincarnation. You know, if, if you just try harder, you can eventually become one with the cosmos. But you've got to go through multiple lives until you demonstrate your worthy. So just keep trying harder. Islam, you know, follow the rules, and God's going to give you 72 virgins and a river of wine. But in the meantime, while you're here, you can rape any little boy you want, just don't touch the girls. Okay. And and you never really know if you're going to get there unless you die in jihad and get killed killing the infidel. But if you get to paradise, if you get 70 virgins, 70 virgins, all your wives get to be your servants and fill your cup with wine. <laughs> and, if, and if the woman isn't connected to a man that makes it, she doesn't make it. Just like Mormonism. If the man doesn't become a god, his wives don't have a chance. But all as many wives, if he becomes a god, they become his wives. These goddesses who repopulate a new planet. Get a theme here? <laughs> you know, kind, of, kind of the same stuff, regardless of where you go. In some ways, there's you know, obviously reincarnation and all this stuff and nirvana and one with the cosmos. And you have this idea of a paradise where you're given all this stuff that's all male-dominated. You know, you have different different avenues, but all these religions, they start sounding alike. Somewhere. So you're macho here on earth and you're macho in heaven? Absolutely. <laughs> Your tongue devises destruction like sharp razors, a worker of deceit. All the religions man comes up with, they all sound good. I can do it. I can do it. They all sound good. Until in the midst of it, as you're trying so hard, you realize, I really can't do it. 
I can never reach that standard. So either walk away or live in despair. What happens when Christianity comes along? As I said, God says you can't do it, so I'll do it for you, and I'll even help you believe in it, and I'll adopt you as my child and give you assurance and promises of the kingdom, which you don't have to do anything to get there. I've done, I've done it for you. Christian comes along and says, you can't do it, I'll do it for you. It's because I love you. So also the tongue is small, a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set afire, the flame by such a small fire. That passage is often used to talk about gossip. That this little bitty organ called a tongue can create a forest fire. Now here in context, we're talking about lies and deceit, but don't gossip, doesn't gossip fall under the category of lies and deceit? No. What do you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites? You are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside are beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Now, Jesus had two ways of dealing with people. By my recollection, only two. He dealt with sinful human beings who understood they were unworthy, understood they were guilty, with great compassion and grace. The woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. You know, is there no one left to bring a charge against you? None, my Lord, and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The leper, who was untouchable, he touches him. The children, who were, un, who were of no value, he takes them in his arms. Okay, Peter, who sinned against him, he's restored. He deals with sinful people with grace and mercy. He deals with religious leaders with harshness and judgment. They were to lead the people in their relationship with God but they created such a barrier between God and the people that the people were lost. So another, maybe when Paul talks that teachers would be held to a higher standard, a stricter judgment, to look at the words of Jesus. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you're hypocrites. If Jesus were to speak a cuss word, that was it. To call them hypocrites was, would be the equivalent of calling them a blankety blank blank blank. Okay, mm -hmm. it's about as strong a cuss word as you could get to say that to you. You're a hypocrite. Okay, whitewash tombs. What did they? Why, when did they whitewash tombs? That's something they did all the time. You know, lime water. Special person. Lime water. No. They wanted to be so careful because they were so religious that when it came time for festivals like Passover or Pentecost or any of these. Festival of Booths, they would go out and whitewash the graves so you wouldn't step on them. Because if you stepped on a grave, you became unclean for seven days and wouldn't be able to participate in the feast. So they'd whitewash the tombs to make sure they didn't make themselves unclean. That's also why a Pharisee or a Sadducee would not enter the home of an unbeliever. Because they all had gated courtyards. Yeah. And the unbelievers would bury their stillborn children in their courtyards. And they could never tell if they're walking in the grave. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. They go to Pilate's place without any reservation to get Jesus crucified. Okay? And they're breaking all the rules, including their own holiness rules, to not go into a Gentile's house because you never know where you're going to step on a grave. Okay? They were doing anything to get rid of Jesus. So they whitewashed the tombs to make them look pretty, but also to make them stand out. You're whitewashed tombs. You look so good in all your fancy robes and chains and all this stuff. But inside, what's inside? Remember that dead animal I talked about? That's what's happening inside a tomb, isn't it? No. That's what you look like on the inside. So you, too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You brood of vipers. What do vipers do? eat their own young. <laughs> right? What are the Pharisees and Sadducees doing? Killing their own people? You brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Yeah. How despicable are you? 
You're killing your own people. Okay? We probably ought to stop there. we got about three minutes. Would that be a good place to stop so we don't start in the verse? Any thoughts? Any questions? Thanks for the coffee. Just another mind blower. Just to, just to recap, the age of accountability doesn't exist. Correct. I mean, Correct. Shattered that one. I, I, that's really great. But, but what I was telling you before is all the churches that had their origin in Europe, back to the early church, origins, um, all have a, a historic, not today, but historically had a very high view of Scripture, the Word of God, a very high view of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. They understood them as a means of grace, an avenue through which God was working to touch a heart, to touch a life. You come to America, and the churches that start after America is established, because we don't want any contact with Europe, mm -hmm. they are all very much the mindset of we can do it. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You oh, can accomplish it. Yeah. And so the theology becomes God's done his part with Jesus, now you have to step up and do your part. So <laughs> baptism becomes something you're doing to demonstrate to the world your choice of God. Lord's Supper becomes something we do that's a remembrance, but there's no power in it. We do it because we're told to, or we just remember it. I have a document on my computer that, that goes through uh, infant baptism in the early church and how it was understood from the time of the apostles forward to the time of the Reformation and how they practiced it. And, and I've talked to you about this before. The closer we can get back to the original understanding and practice of those first Christians, the more likely we are to be accurate in our understanding. If you pick something and say, we're going to do it like it's been done the last 300 years. Great, 300 years. What happened to the previous 1700? If the practice changed after 1700 years, why did it change? Infant baptism was always practiced in the church up until the time of pietism, which is after the Reformation. Okay? Uh, and, and so, and, and 1517 was the Reformation. And so, in, and so, when you go to Europe, all those historic churches and all the historic churches in America still practice infant baptism and have a high view of Scripture and a high view of the Lord's Supper. But those that have their origin here don't. Okay? Let me stop this. Let's pray. Father God, you have blessed us. Thank you for this time of study. We ask that you be with us as we gather in your name to worship you. May you be in our midst that we might truly receive everything your heart desires to give us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.